everyone, and welcome to the fifth episode of Viral Banter. This show has been getting a great response from our Generation Liberty members, and we are so excited to see that. This week, again, we have four amazing campus coordinators from our Generation Liberty team. First off, I'd like to welcome back Theodora, the campus coordinator at Melbourne University, and also my assistant in the office. Welcome back, Theodora. Hey, Renee. Thanks for having me back on the show. Next, also from the University of Melbourne, our part-time model campus coordinator and also our longest running campus coordinator, the most experienced. He's the best debater you'll ever see. Please welcome John Hadjik. Hi, Renee. Good to be with you. So, John, this is actually your first time on the show. So just checking in. How are you doing with the lockdown? Just speaking for myself, I'm doing pretty well. I'm pretty good at staying at home and really not doing much. It seems that actually all the male members of my family are quite good at that. Uh, you know, staying at home and not really getting up to anything. But the uh, the female members of my family, namely my mum and sister, are the opposite. Cannot stay home, cannot sit still. Um, so my mum has, for the last about six or seven weeks, been taking full advantage of that rule that allows you to exercise with one other person. It's been for about four or five bike rides or walks per week with you know members outside the household. But um, I've never never had more time to study, never been more, never done more study. And uh, the government keeps giving me free money that I, to be honest, don't probably deserve. So uh, the bank balance has never been better. I've never got more work done. So everything's all right with me, but I speak for everyone else. Everything's going well for Hajek right now. See, I think I, I identify with your mom and sister. I think um, Jordan Peterson talks about this. Um, the in- difference between extroverts and introverts is um, extroverts kind of feed off other people. And I think I realised how much of an extrovert I am right now because I need other people to like get my enthusiasm going. And I'm just if there's nobody else around, I just get a bit sad. I'm, really, <laughs> but... I'm realising how much work you can get done when you don't have to see all those you know, pesky friends or anything. <laughs> But this is why we have Vara Banter, so I can keep in touch with you all. So um, bringing on to the, our next two people onto the panel, more familiar faces. First off, we have Boston from the University of Wollongong. Welcome onto the show again, Boston. Hi, Renee. Thanks for having me back. And Laura Glaze from the University of Sydney. Welcome back, Laura. Hi, Renee. Good to see you. You generally have a really beautiful setup, so I need to get your criticism on my new setup. It's lovely. Look- I am a big fan of colour and that is something that I've been working on. And so I love, I love the colour. Your old background was good and we, we were vibing with that. But I, it's nice, it's nice to look at. I'd get very distracted by it if I was there. I do kind of feel like I'm a colour explosion right now. Um, it's good. But, it's but, so yeah. underrated. No, notice I matched my lipstick to my cardigan today. So <gasps> mm, that was, the little that was thing like that. Perfect. So um, half our panel today is from Victoria and half of our panel is in New South Wales. I've lived in both. Um, So I would like to start off the show discussing your thoughts on how your state government has handled it. Um, First off, Boston, it looks like New South Wales is going to start um, easing some restrictions. What are your thoughts on that? Um, So we've already started easing some restrictions since last Friday and those restrictions enabled us to see... um, people for mental health reasons and for socialisation reasons, as long as there's two adults visiting other people in their homes, obviously following strict social distancing rules, which I think is great because a lot of people have been suffering from mental health and suffering under lockdown, not being able to see their friends or family for so long. So that was a great move. But I'm a little bit disappointed, to be honest, because... It's been um, disclosed by the Premier quite recently, Gladys Berejiklian, that um, New South Wales won't see any restrictions easing prior to Mother's Day, or at least in the near future. So the Premier, I, I feel like our government has been pretty quiet when it comes to Scott Morrison saying restrictions might be eased by Friday. And then all of a sudden, a day or two before these supposed national restrictions will be eased, the Premier comes forth and says, actually, no, we're not actually going to ease restrictions in line with other states. Yeah, I can see that would why that would be disappointing. And mm. especially since you're seeing such a positive um, impact from just the slight um, thing that you can go and see someone else for mental health reasons. Uh, 
yeah, I've exactly. come to New South Wales, so I've been seeing, like, the sweetest post I saw the other day is one of my friend's sons, who's only four, got to reunite with his best friend, who's also four, mm -hmm. and them hugging, and it was just like, it feels like that kid has more freedom than a kid in a state with more restrictions. But, Laura, do you think um, even just the small amount that New South Wales has had um, just with that one ease of restriction has given them hope. And um, have you seen reunions like this that have, have given you some positive news? Yeah, I do think that it's given a lot of people hope, especially those who are ordinary citizens and the only way that they're getting information on uh, on the coronavirus response, um, restrictions, what's being increased, what's being relaxed. A lot of people are, are getting that information only from, uh, you know, their news sites, from the government, from their their daily uh, news conferences and press releases. And so, just by you know, the, uh, the, just by the announcement of the relaxation of some restrictions, it does give a lot of people hope because this is their figure of authority that is you know, for the past few months been telling them what's going on and, and telling them what they can and cannot do. So for, for, for a figure that has in, that has in the past um, been, been playing such a, a key role in restricting our lives, the fact that they've now announced that we can start the process of relaxing them. It has given a lot of people hope and a lot of people some, some reason to, to, to feel some joy and excitement over that. Um, I, I can't say that I've seen many, reunions in New South Wales maybe that's just because I'm I'm not I'm not out um, but it it did I did I did catch up with with a friend um, I was able to 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 go see them um, when it was announced that adults of, of you know two can can go to uh, another household so I was able to see a friend and that was just magical in every sense of the word um, but yeah that, that that's about it but I'm sure they're happening and it is really really lovely and heartwarming to know that so many months of separation um, are now hopefully coming to a close. Yeah, I think that's some really good news that we're getting out just from even those small lacks uh, of restrictions. But John, across the border in Victoria, we have some of the harshest restrictions still in place, well, the harshest restrictions in the country still in place. Why do you think that is? And, and do you uh, agree with it? And um, what do you think it's going to have a, as an impact on Victoria overall? Well, Daniel Andrews always said, even when Scott Morrison said they would relax restrictions this Friday, he always said they would wait a bit longer. Um, I don't exactly know why that was at the time, and I was sad to hear that because I obviously want restrictions to be relaxed. Unfortunately, now in Victoria, we've had the whole um, Cedar Meats, you know, the small cluster outbreak at Cedar Meats, where instead of having you know two or three or four cases a day, for the last couple of days, we've reported 17 or something. So unfortunately, I feel like uh, Daniel Andrews is going to feel very vindicated now and uh, feel justified in keeping a lot of these restrictions in place. I, I think they do go too far. We have, I mean, not only have we expanded our ICU capacity uh, in preparation for what might come, there's also there's fewer people in ICU and hospital than there have ever been before because there are fewer people getting in car accidents, all that sort of thing, fewer people contracting other diseases from the distancing. So we've got this hospital capacity. I think we might as well use some more of it. The whole point of this flatten the curve concept was not that nobody would get it. It was that the same number of people would get it but over a long period of time so health services could cope. I think we're going to have to be willing to accept a few more cases, whether it's 17 or 20 a day, maybe even more than that. Um, because that might be the price we pay for loosening the restrictions, which I think we have to do. I mean, we can't just keep expecting that, um, you know, we, ha we have to have no more than three or four cases or zero cases in each state per day. I think that's unreasonable. We're going to have to show a bit of metal and, uh, and put up with a few more. Um, and if, if that's the cost that comes with loosening all these restrictions that are just devastating the economy, that might be worth it. I'm looking out my window right now, across, right across the street from my house, there's a cafe there, which is a totally bustling cafe. And some new owners bought it and took it over in about February or something. So how unlucky can you get <laughs> in terms of uh, when to buy a cafe? So, it's, I mean, it's those people that I particularly feel sorry for. I do you also wonder, worry that if um, Victoria is the last state to open up, that it will have a larger economic impact here and that Victoria will be left behind? 
I mean, I think so. I mean, obviously, just the longer this goes on, the the, the greater cost it has, and I, I worry that. I mean, just obviously, it's quite hard to uh, move into state now. But uh, assuming you could, more people would obviously be willing to uh, go to where there are fewer restrictions. It's going to be easier to find jobs or easier to open a business. But yeah. um, that the longer it goes on, I mean, the harder it is to recover. For most businesses, can probably survive. Uh, you know, a few weeks of lockdown and then um, go back to business as usual. But if your business can't survive a certain period of lockdown and it folds, um, it's not easy to come back from there. So Victoria could be left behind if it keeps too harsh restrictions in place for too long, I fear. It also, I think um, uh, it's going to be interesting uh, when the state borders get opened up again, because Melbourne actually has um, the highest internal migration in Australia or used to have the highest internal migration. So if people were going to move to a city, they were going to move to Melbourne. And I think that that might change significantly, which would have a massive impact on the state overall. But outside cities, Theodora, you live in regional Victoria, you live in Ballarat. Do you think these areas may be harder hit by the ec economic impact? Uh, yeah, I definitely think regional areas would, will potentially be the hardest hit. Um, I'm seeing so many small businesses in my area really struggling to stay afloat, as you would imagine, given the lack of tourism, the lack of foot traffic in town and the widespread fear about going into the city and interacting with people. But I guess what's interesting is that these local businesses are being creative in the ways they've stayed open and the way that they're interacting with their customers. So for example, my favorite local bookstore is now doing hand delivery to your door and um, local bakeries are setting up like shop windows and people walk past and get their bread every day through a window instead of going to the store. So I think even though these local businesses have been hard hit, people are trying to support them in new ways um, and you're getting and the sense of community spirit in these hard times. So I think with any luck, people will start rallying around small businesses um, and really supporting them even more than they did before. And that's gonna be really important in uh, the recovery phase of local economies in the weeks and months ahead. Yeah, I think it's kind of a two-sided issue as is, there's some negatives and positives there. I do think overall, there's going to be a harsher economic impact in regional areas just because that generally tends to happen historically. But you do have those tighter community ties there, which I think we've realised are such an important thing during events like this. Um, so when you've already got those community links, it means you don't have to build them from scratch, um, which some inner city areas may have to be doing and it's, it's a little bit harder. But um, I spent my first years of my uni living regionally. I used to live in Wollongong, um, not far from you in the Illawarra, Boston. Um, there was already a massive youth unemployment rate in these towns when I was living there. I remember how long it took me to get my first casual job when I was at uni. Do you worry about the pack that this could have across the Illawarra? Most definitely. It's kind of sad, really, that a lot of people, you know, young people in the OR, they want to move. They'll have to move to Sydney or another place to find good, well-paid jobs when they leave uni. And even, like, now or before, pre-COVID-19, the um, it was so difficult for people to get jobs. My, a lot of my friends were jobless for years until they found a job as a waitress at a cafe or something like that and the impact that this will have on the Illawarra I think in the short term will be very negative will be though you'll see a lot we are seeing a lot more young people out of the job out of their jobs. But Laura before this pandemic the boundaries between states I feel like they didn't feel, really feel real people move from state to state all the time I remember when I moved to Wollongong from Wollongong to Melbourne I thought, you know, I'm moving from a reasonably good state government and moving to a, you know, a Labor government, which I think is pretty appalling, but I didn't really think it would have a much of an impact on my life. Do you think in the, in, in the aftermath of this, people are going to be thinking more about where they live and, and more about what state they live in and more focused on what those state governments can do? Mm, absolutely. It's been pretty confronting for for people who used to have, you know, all the freedom in the world to travel 
anywhere in their own state and of course anywhere in a in a neighboring state um you know people took it for granted they didn't really think much of it uh and and for now it's it's been very clear to see how easily those rights can be taken away from us uh by you know by our governments by our state governments um uh, and so uh, people will certainly be more mindful i think of the rights that exist in their own state and who who controls that and who gives those rights to them uh, but also far more aware of what is happening in other states. You know, I, I feel before this, we didn't really know or perhaps didn't even care what was happening on the other side of Australia, unless there was something super intense or super exciting happening was pretty much as long as we know what's happening in at least my state, New South Wales, then that's fine. We're happy. But now, you know, we're reading the news and we are, we've started comparing ourselves, you know, New South, the by, by, you know, unfortunately, you know, uh, cases, coronavirus cases, death rates. We started comparing ourselves state to state on the job that our own respective state governments have been doing. And so people will come out of this either with a greater appreciation and say, you know, at least my state did better than this state. You know, why is that? Maybe because our premier did a bit of a better job, our health minister, our, um, our chief medical officer, uh, or they may, you know, on the flip side, compare their state to someone else and, and, and really see that there are great flaws in the way that their government is being run and flaws in the response, um, both immediate as restrictions were being implemented, but also, you know, in the aftermath. And I think that we still have a long way to go. You know, the, the role of the, the state government is certainly not over yet. Uh, uh, by lifting these restrictions, we're seeing, you know, the uh, case by case, you know, the cases rise every day, uh, even though they, they decrease and plateaued. And, you know, the Premier is coming out saying, you know, that's to be expected as there's more activity in society. Uh, but we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what the model looks like. So the, their role suddenly isn't over. And so I think there's going to be this judgment for a very long time as we watch how our state governments respond to this and, and compare that to other states' responses. Yeah, I think you make some really strong points there. John, do you think there's a possibility that this could bring a back questions about state government powers and federalism in the wake of this? Possibly. I mean... I think it's brought home to some people the fact that we do live in a federation. I could sort of hear out the corner of my ear the other night, um, my mum listening to a, a press conference of the Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews when he was saying that we're a federation of states and each state will go her own way. Um, and Victoria waited a little longer and I heard her say, no, we're not, we're one country. But Daniel Andrews is right. We are a federation of states. Um, the point is that to at least to some degree states can go their own way and i think possibly people in victoria in the near future might be upset about that because we might have to live under these restrictions a bit longer people in wa or south australia where they've had no cases for quite a few days are probably happy about it because they uh, can see restrictions lifted sooner and i think that's probably a, a, it is a good thing in general whether or not you agree or disagree with daniel andrews that states can go their own ways. I heard the other day that New York State, or well, sorry, New York City, um, has had 16 times as many deaths per 100,000 people from COVID-19 as Los Angeles, the second biggest city in America. And there's obviously very valid reasons for that. In New York, everyone crams into subway carriages and elevators and the disease spreads much more rampantly, whereas in LA, everyone drives everywhere. Uh, the population's so much spread out, so much more spread out, it's far less density. So there's no point, there's no reason that both those places should have the same severity of restrictions. Um, and in the same vein, there's no point why WA, which has had no cases for a few days, as far as I'm aware, should have the same severity of restrictions as other states, which are experiencing cases, are still experiencing cases. So I think that is one of the benefits of a federal system, um, even if, as I say, people who live in Victoria, where well, we might have to endure these restrictions a bit longer, um, are upset that Victoria doesn't follow the advice of the, uh, the federal government and uh, send kids back to schools or lift restrictions a bit earlier. Yeah, the, I think there's some really interesting points you've made there. I think one of the problems is um, federalism, uh, when it works best, it's a, it's a competitive federalism model, and that involves movement. Exactly. So that means that the states, 
can compete and do lower taxations and, you know, they'll actually be responsible for taxation. So people can move around and they have, you know, they have uh, an incentive to do the right thing for their people. But right now they don't collect taxes. It's the federal government that does it. They ask them for their handout. So they have all this power but they don't actually have much responsibility because um, they could just go back and blame the federal government. But I just think it's good that we're opening up this discussion again. Um, and I think people are going to be asking questions about it again. What are your thoughts, Theodore, on it? Yeah, I agree with you, Renee, that um, now that people can't really move about from state to state, there's just going to be uh, a lot more uh, self-reflection in the states. People are going to sort of I think we are already seeing in Victoria an erosion of trust in state government and uh, people are really questioning the draconian measures which have been put in place here. So yeah, I think conversations are going to start um, happening that are questioning the way things are run between the states, for sure. And Boston, do you want New South Wales to secede and become its own country now? Uh, oh, sorry. I'm not much of a successionist, but uh, I do see the pros and cons of succeeding from the Federation. So New South Wales, prior to this um, pandemic, we were putting a lot of money into the National Purse through GST, and we weren't getting much back. Like, well, the only other state really that was worse impact, is worse impacted by GST is Western Australia. So we're the economic powerhouse well, our government claims we're the economic powerhouse of Australia, yet we don't see much money returning to us through the federal budget. So I think it's a little bit unfair that other states are um, relying on our money, the money that we make here in New South Wales, to function because they have poor economic management. But uh, I, I think I don't think there will be any successionist movements anytime soon in New South Wales. That's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one thing that does emphasise state boundaries at all times, um, especially on the East Coast, um, but all across Australia, is um, football codes and sport. And it, and it does look like the NRL is going to go back sooner than the AFL, um, but there is more discussion going on about how we get back to sport. Um, do you think having sport back is something that is going to be really important for getting Australia back to normal, Laura? Yeah, I do. I mean, I'm going to come at this in a completely unbiased way. I am by no means a, a sport fanatic or an NRL. Is that right? NRL fanatic? <laughs> um, but yes, it's NRL. I, it's NRL. Okay, just wanted to check. I don't want to, you know, say anything and have all the comments be like, it's not NRL. Um, but I think just looking at it from what sport and particularly the NRL symbolizes in Australia you know we are a sport loving country we love to get together we love to watch you know regardless of the season regardless of what the sport is we love to get together and and watch you know whether it's actually going out um, to the field where it's being played or um, in our own homes and so it will be an important part of everything reopening I think it'll just uh, what, what what people are, are missing at the moment is not only their usual routine but just human connection and, and being with people and you know, I think you're, you're, you're never more aware of being around people than when, you, when you're in a packed stadium or you're in your, your home with friends gathered around. So it'll, it'll symbolise a lot, I think. And that, that's something to be really looking forward to. And uh, Boston, do you think that um, sport is like a vital part of Australian communities and it's something that we really need back as soon as possible? Um, most definitely. I'm not a sport fanatic either, but even I'm... I tend to go out with friends to watch the footy or um, I know that a lot of my family members, they love playing their football with their mates and yada, yada, yada. But like, there's also a very important um, aspect of sport, which enables young people to flourish. So for example, there's a foundation called the Clon, you will know it, um, Clonta, Clonta. Clonta. Clontarf, Clontarf I think. I think you're Clontarf. referring to Clontarf. Clontarf, yes, yeah, sorry. The I indigenous, make... is, it, is the Indigenous Sporting Group? Yes, Yeah, I think that, Clontarf, yeah. So it's a national um, foundation that encourages young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, boys to attend school through sport. 
but it teaches them a lot of life skills and it has had a massive success rating enabling and keeping these boys going to school, which will allow them to have a better standard of living once they leave and be able to secure better jobs. So sport not only is a great pastime, but it's actually an enabler of so many other things that we hold most dear. Yeah, I think the work that they do is absolutely amazing and it Definitely. shows what an impact sport can have, um, especially in young men's life, teaching them discipline and routine, um, things like that is, is so, so important. Um, but John, there is still a question that it look kind of looks like maybe NRL is going to go back before AFL. Um, whatever way it ha- happens, do you think that could cause more tension in the Australian community if some people get their footy back and some people don't? Um, I don't know about tension, but I do think that, I mean, there'll be a, a big first mover advantage to whichever code comes back first. Uh, we saw that because uh, they had round one of the AFL, meanwhile, all sport in America was cancelled. There were, it was quite a um, cult following of AFL football developed in, um, in America. And the same could happen, for example, if NRL comes back before AFL, that people who would normally be AFL fans might be starved of their preferred code and might uh, watch NRL as an alternative. So, I mean, I I don't think people will feel necessarily divided over it, although obviously fans of whatever code returns latest are going to be upset. But uh, as I said, I think there'd be a huge advantage for whatever code comes back first. Well, kind Um, of on that, um, I am kind of, well, of course, I'm hoping NRL goes back first. Um, But... One of the main reasons I am hoping that NRL goes back first is that our fearless leader, John Roscombe, said in our um, office footy tips chat, and we screenshotted this, so we've got evidence that if NRL starts before AFL, I will convert, and Zach, my husband, um, I'll ask Zach who I should choose um, to support. So if NRL goes back before AFL, I am express posting John Roscombe a Dragons jersey. No, I'll be express posting a <laughs> Rabbitohs jersey. <laughs> he said he's going to ask Zach for um, the, the choice, but um, I'm happy to have another a- a- a New South Wales team thrown in there. I know that um, Tristan and a few of the Queenslanders in the office are trying to convince him to go Broncos or Titans or Cowboys. Um, but... It is, uh, it's been a funny conversation that I think it's personally it has caused a little bit of uh, tension uh, that uh, I've noticed between even just the IPA staff about which one's going to go back first. I don't um, think anything will persuade me to uh, become an NRL <laughs> fan, but we'll see. So um, something that goes along with footy in most people's heads in Australia is the pub. And it seems it's something that everyone's missing a lot. So to close today's show, the last question of the show, I want you to tell me your perfect pub meal, um, what you like the meal, the place, the drink that goes with it, um, and why you're so excited to do something like that again. So Boston, what's your favourite pub meal? Uh, I miss the pub so much. And one of my favourite pub meals is vegetarian nachos. (laughs) So good. Mm. From uh, North Wollongong Pub. So that's one of my favourites. It's a laid back and there's a lot of young uni students who go there it's all happening at North Gong Pub. <laughs> and the drink of choice is either uh, Han Super Dry or Glass of Savion Blanc. Nice choice. North Wollongong Hotel used to be right near my house and I spent yeah, a I lot of time there. Um, <laughs> well, it, 750, 7.50 Snitty Days. They used to have 7.50 Snitty Night. That was they so still have that. But well, they not still at the moment, but snitty. they had it right up until the pub closed for COVID, but they still have it. And I'll be bringing like, it back, definitely. Yeah, we well, better bring, bring it back. I think they all they changed it to eight dollars for a while, and there was such an uproar they had to go back. There was a, there was a huge <laughs> uproar on URW rants and like on Facebook. It was hilarious. But people, yeah, thank God they brought it back down to seven dollars fifty. People really care about schnitzels. Yes. So, John, what is uh, your favourite pub meal? Uh, well, being a vegan, I'm kind of restricted to just the chips, but that's perfectly fine with me. I think hot chips are pretty much the ultimate food, and Washed down, I think probably with a pale ale. I have a tra- well, had a tradition with a friend where every footy season we'd go down to um, the Terminus Hotel every week, um, which is a pub in North Fitzroy, um, where you you, read, you pay twenty dollars to do the footy TV competition at the start of the year and every week when you 
go and put your tips in in person, you get free beer. Um, so it's, you know, 20 bucks for 20 beers, basically, or, you know, 23 beers, which is fine with us. Um, so I think that probably won't happen at all this season, unfortunately, but hopefully next season we can, we can go back. Sounds good. And uh, Theodora, what's your favourite pub meal and where, what pub do you miss? Uh, I was going to say I miss pizza, but Boston's suggestion of the nachos is an excellent one. So I'm going to go with that. Um, I really miss going to the Mitre near the IPA office because that's like obviously got great memories, great associations with um, the IPA. So I'm looking forward to going back there um, once this is all over and yeah, just hanging out after work. I think that's probably my favourite spot. I think all of us at the IPA are really missing the Mitre. Mitre is actually also the oldest pub in Melbourne. I think possibly the person mis- missing it the most might be Gideon, though. I think oh, definitely. <laughs> For sure. I don't know how he's survived this long. <laughs> <laughs> and Laura, what, what's your perfect pub meal? Well, so anyone who is familiar with the University of Sydney or has been on campus, you don't even have to go there as a student. If you've been there, then you know where this place is. Um, it's the Royal Hotel. So the Royal Hotel is is just down the road from uni and it has $10 steaks. So all day, any day of the week, you go there for a $10 steak and it's and 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 you get your size, you get your choice of sides, you can have mash or chips or veggies or salad and your choice of sauces and it's 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 just it's quite an experience. And so it's just I really, really miss having a day of uni and then ending it by strolling down to the pub with with friends. Uh, or if you've tucked into like a late night study sesh, just taking a 10 minute break, walking down to the pub, getting your steak and then hopping back. Um, so for, for, for drinks, I, I'm a, I'm a huge lemon lime bitters fan. Nice. Kind of, it's, sorry. And it, it goes with everything. Sorry. <laughs> Definitely give that a try. Ah, uh, yes. The Royal, the Royal actually has a special place in the heart for Generation Liberty. We've run events there mm. multiple times because it's so Off close to Sydney yeah. Uni. Oh yeah, it's so very, very popular. Mm. Fun memories, very yeah. popular. Popular, popular, um, and always popular with our members with the ten dollar steak and ten dollar jugs of beer. So it's it's a great and t- exactly. It's, it's a great, really like, great it's, place to hang out. It's appealing for everyone, you know. It's affordable for the students, and that's what that's what really matters. <laughs> and and the staff are always so accommodating. They give you rooms for free for events. Yeah, we miss the room. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we miss it. Um, and one more thing on today's show, I had the absolute pleasure of listening to the first episode of the uh, Generation Liberty book club podcast called Better Red Than Dead today, which should be being released in the next few days. Um, Theodora was one of the stars on that show. And when it comes out, you must listen to this because I think it's um, one of the best podcasts I've listened to in a while. Um, Theodora, do you want to talk about it for a little bit? Yeah, so I was lucky enough to have a great conversation about our first book club choice, Heart of Darkness, um, on this podcast, um, chatting to the IPA's Dr. Bella Debrera and Luca Rossi, our campus coordinator at Monash. So yeah, we had a lot of fun um, getting into some of the big ideas of the book and uh, discussing the historical context and why young people should be reading this still in 2020. So yeah, I'm looking forward to everyone seeing it and everyone should read the book and then listen to the podcast. Definitely agree there. And if you want more information on the Generation Liberty book club, the podcast, everything we're putting out right now, make sure you are a member of Generation Liberty by going to generationliberty.org.au for the low price of $10. You can join today. You'll get free books. You'll get a huge box of merch and you'll get all the latest updates on um, shows like this and new shows that we're releasing uh, in the future. So I hope you are a member and if you're not, you will join very, very soon. Thank you so much for listening. And I would love to thank all our guests today. I think this was a really, really fun episode, and I love having a chat with my coordinator. Thank you. So that's another viral banter for the week. Um, for the time being, stay safe, stay happy, and stay free. Bye. <laughs>